Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today, our topic is, what do I need to know about female hormones? Female hormones are fascinating, and we have a problem in the United States where we are not paying attention to how to actually fix them. Right now, we're covering them up and we're papering them over. What happens is a young person will go into a doctor's office or a nurse's office. It's usually a girl who is 12, 14 years old, and she's starting to get some symptoms of her first period or her first few periods, and they're starting to get unmanageable. She gets symptoms of PMS. She might have problems with ovulation. She might have breakthrough bleeding. She might have ovarian cysts, uterine fibroids. She might have fibrocystic breast disease. A third of American women have fibrocystic breast disease, and it's absolutely unnecessary. She might have foggy thinking. She might, have, she might get hangry when she, when she gets low blood sugar. She might suddenly notice that the, the week before her period begins, the PMS time, that she is irritable and her family doesn't like her very much and she doesn't like herself and she reports that she doesn't feel very good. She may have trouble in school during that time and difficulty concentrating and difficulty focusing and she may be diagnosed with something like ADHD that only pops up during that time of the month. She could have menstrual cramps, menstrual periods, excessive flow, and she could be bleeding five to seven days of the month, which a lot of Americans think is normal. By the way, what is the normal number of days that a woman around the world of any, of any race, creed, country, you know, should be, should be bleeding during their period? Well, it's three and a half days. It's three and a half days. So it's really important to know that we know a lot about female hormones and we know how to balance them. And the last thing we should be doing, not that it should never be done, but the last thing that we should be doing is papering over these problems by saying, oh, just give her the birth control pill, not necessarily for birth control, but for her regulation of her hormones. Because what that does is it puts a synthetic chemical on top of her body in its own wisdom and its own feedback loops and it says, cover up the symptoms. And now she's destined to a lifetime of not really knowing why her hormones were imbalanced. So why do hormones get imbalanced? They get imbalanced because of problems with estrogen and progesterone and the cholesterol pathway. The cholesterol pathway starts with acetyl-CoA, which is a small little molecule, and it becomes cholesterol and it becomes pregnenolone and progesterone and estrogen and testosterone and aldosterone and cortisol, which is a stress hormone, and all kinds of different stuff. And on that cascade down the river of hormones, it's affected by enzymes called delta-5 and delta-60 saturase enzymes. And these enzymes are the ones that, that uh, statin molecules affect when, when we give people statin drugs for heart disease and for cholesterol. We also mess with this system when we give people too many carbs. If you have too many carbs, or if you have too many omega-6 fats compared to omega-3s, or if you have oxidized fats from PUFAs, polyunsaturated fatty acids, which come from seed oils, you're going to get imbalances of your chemistry, and a woman is going to get problems where she's going to make excess estrogen and store it in her fat cells, and she's going to have a relative difference between her estrogen and her progesterone. So even if the poor girl is deficient in both estrogen and progesterone, if her relative spread between estrogen and progesterone is, is high, she's going to have estrogen dominance symptoms. And those are all the symptoms that I talked about. Estrogen is a molecule that, a series of molecules, there's actually three different kinds of estrogens that we use and three different kinds of toxic estrogens that must be cleared from our bodies. So the woman ends up messing with her hormones by having too much sugar or too much omega-6s or, or the wrong kinds of fats and not enough saturated fats. And what happens to her is she gets this estrogen dominance relative to progesterone. Even if both of them are deficient, one may appear more than the other. All those symptoms are estrogen-like symptoms. And estrogen tends to be the type of molecule that softens a body tissues, it prepares the body for implantation so that a fertilized ovum can become um, viable and it can live in, inside the uterus. So estrogen is the great softening molecule, whereas progesterone is the great firming molecule. It tends to firm up tissue and it tends to get tissue to be less boggy, less full of water, less what's called friable, which means it's less terrible, it's less, it's less weak. And so when, when a person has an estrogen dominance, they feel weak and they feel weepy and they feel soft. And when a woman has enough progesterone, she feels strong and vibrant and feminine, but she also feels a sense of firmness and strength and, and resistance, not, not necessarily too much softness and, and weakness and, and weepiness. And this happens in men too. If men get too much estrogen, they'll feel weepy and they'll feel too emotional and they'll feel very volatile and they won't, they won't do very well. So this is affected by diet in the United States. It's, it's terribly affected by insulin resistance, which is probably the big factor. 
Most of us eat too many carbs compared to fat and compared to protein. The idea that you, that you need to eat a lot of carbs is really a myth, and it was started in the 1950s by Ansel Keys. My colleagues have talked a lot about this and done a far better job than I explaining this whole process, so I'm not going to beat that horse to death. I think the, the importance is to know that if we understand hormones and if we understand diet, the body is a self-healing organism, and these young ladies can, can get better, and they can repair themselves, and they don't have to become a volatile mess during the cycle. During the first half of the cycle, from the end of the period to ovulation is about two weeks. And so what happens is estrogen rises and, and elevates, and then it peaks right before ovulation. And that's the time of the period before ovulation. And then there's another two weeks after ovulation where estrogen goes way down and progesterone goes way high up. And that is after ovulation. You ovulate, you release an egg from the corpus luteum, from the ovary, travels down the fallopian tube and, and ends up, you know, either leaving the body or, or being uh, implanted and, and fertilized and implanted and pregnant. And so when the ovulation happens, the ovulation takes about two days and that's when there should be an increase in cervical mucus, there should be a mild increase in temperature, there should be, there's, a, there's often a little bit, if you're imbalanced, a little bit of immune weakness. The immune system is a little bit weaker and you're more prone to catch a cold or more prone to catch some kind of, you know, bacteria or some kind of problem where you might act your body might act as though it's infected. You might be more susceptible to seasonal allergies during those two days too, if you're out of balance. Now, if you're in balance, you don't need to have that. You're, you're, you don't need to have any of these symptoms. But one of the first areas that fall apart in the female hormone system, the most vulnerable time of the month is the two days of ovulation and the five days right before the period begins. So then if we continue looking after ovulation, we have that big peak of, of progesterone and estrogen goes down, as progesterone finally goes down and estrogen goes down and, and vanishes down to nothing, that vanishing of both hormones is what triggers the period to begin. And so the period should begin, and if there were any PMS symptoms, they should go away. They should resolve, and the person should feel like, oh, the period has started, the blood is flowing, and I'm relieved of all my symptoms. That's what happens most of the time in a moderately imbalanced female. If the female is, is pretty balanced hormonally, nothing happens. All she might have is, is during ovulation, a sense of, of ovulation, like a pinge, a little twinge that happens as one ovary releases an egg, and it'll be uh, on, on one month, it'll be the left side, and the other month, it'll be the right side, and then it'll be the left side. And so every month, it's the opposite ovary, usually, usually. Now, certainly, a woman can release all her eggs from one ovary and not have any from the other, or she can do two from one ovary, or she can do you know, three in a row from one ovary and then do the other ovary. All this stuff can happen based on stress and trauma and car accidents and falls and all kinds of things. But the general idea is that the system in balance would be left, right, left, right every other month. And when it's not, that's how we get twins and that's how we get all kinds of different modifications of, of, of when eggs come out and what they do. So the end of the, of the cycle, uh, or, or rather the, the end of the hormone states where they resolve and, and they, they dwindle down to nothing, triggers the beginning of the three and a half day period of bleeding and that should be all the symptoms going away. If the symptoms don't go away and they worsen or they get new symptoms that begin with the onset of bleeding of the period, that's probably an inability to clear either estrogen or progestin types of hormones. This is a difficulty that some women have and it's a little worse than, than the usual, which is yeah, I get relieved when my period begins. So when everything gets resolved and estrogen starts to rise again, we start to see the, the person enter that pre-ovulatory phase of two weeks, and they usually feel quite good. They usually feel quite good from the beginning of the period through the three and a half days, through the two weeks of pre-ovulation. They feel pretty good at ovulation, and they feel pretty good a week after ovulation, and then a week before, a week after ovulation, but a week before the period begins, that's the PMS week. That's the five days or so that a woman might not feel so good if she's out of balance. It, mind you, she shouldn't. If she's healthy, she shouldn't have anything. She shouldn't know she's even, you know, female. <laughs> Just kidding. But what she's looking at is no breast tenderness, no cramps, no need for, for cramp medication, no excessive flow, no heavy flow, no irregular flow, no spotting, none of that. All of that stuff goes away. And I'm telling you, I've done this for hundreds and hundreds of women with my practice and with other doctors and other people working, and, and you can normalize this in most people. Now, of course, there's people that can't, and I don't want to uh, make it sound like I'm downgrading those people. I'm not. But, um, but please know that one of the biggest things that happens to young women, and even women of any age, is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian, ovarian syndrome is PCOS, 
and it's where you get cysts on your ovary or ovaries, and it comes from usually high carbs that cause an increase in free testosterone. So you can do a lab test for total testosterone and free testosterone in the blood of yes females to see if they've got excess free testosterone. Free testosterone is the unbound kind that's active and free and not bound to a protein molecule so that it can work around your body and do stuff like cause PCOS. So that'll also give women little uh, dense hairs. So they might get hairs on their chin that are very dense like a man's hairs, very thick and very, very pointy and very strong, not soft and downy like a typical female facial hair. So when you see that, that might be a sign that your testosterone is getting high and that your sugar is too high and your carbs need to be attenuated and you need to look at that. The end of the story here is that we need to balance not just female hormones as I've been talking about, but we need to balance adrenals, which is cortisol and epinephrine. We need to balance the thyroid hormone system and we need to balance that with the ovarian system because that, that triangle of, of adrenal, thyroid, and, and ovarian system are extremely linked in women and it's much more important for them to keep them balanced than it is for men, even though it's important for men too, but women notice it a lot more and their bodies are much more subtly attuned to that. Stress can be a big deal. Stress alone, trauma, head injury, mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, stress and, and work stress and sleep stress and family stress, all of these things can contribute to messing up hormones and not getting enough omega-3s and, of course, not getting enough antioxidants. A person's antioxidant status, or, or what we call oxidative stress, can be measured in their blood and, and their urine in different ways, and we can look at their bodies and say, yeah, you've got some oxidative stress, we need to get rid of that with things like vitamins A and E and, and D, and the water-soluble antioxidants like vitamin C or pycnogenol. These are different water-soluble and then fat-soluble vitamins. You need a mixture of both to make sure that your, your body's balanced. There are a bunch of herbs that can be used. I'm not going to go into those today, but there's a bunch of herbs that can be used to balance the estrogen side and the progesterone side. There's also herbs that can be used to not support them, uh, as I just said, but actually to decrease them. Detoxification herbs like turmeric and boswellia and other herbs that can bring down milk thistle, that can bring down the excess estrogens. Because some women have excess estrogen, some people have too, less, too little estrogen, some are imbalanced between the three estrogens, E1, 2, and 3, some have too little progesterone, some have too much progesterone, some are messed up by progesterone creams because they store progesterone in their fat cells and then they have a problem with their feedback loop, and still other women have problems with testosterone and even other hormones like cortisol and epinephrine. So there's a lot more we can talk about. We'll probably get into that with SNPs and genes later, but that's the basic idea of what you need to know about how the female hormone system works before you try and fix it.